Good day, everybody. Coach Troy Brown here. And today we're talking about the muscle hypertrophy, central, the foundational principles in regards to building muscle, how to train for muscle mass. So before we get going, the information that I'm going to give you is some research included in this and also more anecdotal approach to building muscle. So even though the information still to this day, no one really has the blueprint. Nobody really has the um, correct program in order to build muscle. And the science is still being researched today. So let's get started and sit back, relax. And hopefully you'll get some information here that's really going to help you move forward in your muscle building endeavor. So what is hypertrophy? Building muscle. Well, hypertrophy is basically increasing the volume, increasing the mass, increasing the size, increasing the cross-sectional area of a muscle that is basically hypertrophy in a nutshell so now that you understand hypertrophy the essential stimulus or the essential stimuli mechanisms of hypertrophy there's three of them my current research is coming from dr brad schoenfield he is the leading expert in hypertrophy and what he's come up with is these three mechanisms. Number one, mechanical tension. Number two, metabolic stress. And number three, muscle damage. Now let's start with number one, mechanical tension. Mechanical tension is king, right? We're putting stress on the muscle. Mechanical tension is the primary driver uh, of force production. Now, if we go to number two, metabolic stress, metabolic stress is, think about metabolic stress as potentially high reps, um, trying to get a pump, so to speak. You would class it as um, metabolic stress as lactate. You would class it as high rep training. You would also use it as an accumulation of metabolites, including lactate, including hydrogen ions, calcium, MAP kinase, um, mTOR. There's hundreds of them. Um, basically, it's just accumulation. There's so many metabolites. Um, number three is muscle damage, basically where you just put in the stress on the sarcomere, which is the smallest unit of contraction. Um, it's mumbo jumbo. Basically, you're putting stress on the muscle and you're causing inflammation in those uh, muscle fibers. So moving on, there are two main types of hypertrophy, um, but there's actually from what Schoenfeld is talking about, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, PhD, he says that there's three, there's one missing, which I didn't really put in this particular webinar for you. But the, the third one is the connective tissue, which is, I believe, 20, maybe 30 percent of our body has connective tissue. And you've got to remember about connective tissue, it's dynamic. It just doesn't sit there in the body. It's dynamic and it can grow. Um, but let me talk about these two most important ones is myofibril and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. You're probably thinking, what the hell does that mean? It's a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Um, myofibril training, you would say is heavier loads. Sarcoplasmic, you would say is pump training. Okay, in a nutshell. And I'm going to kind of go over these in more detail for you. So that way you've got a clear understanding and you've got some action steps when you walk into the gym. So moving on. Let's go with psychoplasmic pump training, right? Because this is basically where I see most people that are training. If I go to a lot of the commercial gyms and I see a lot of people training in the gyms, and you can see obviously through their, their, their energy in the gym that they want to build muscle, right? The majority of people that I see, 97% of people that are training in the gyms in North America that I can see, you might be someone that's completely different. And, and if that's you, congratulations. But psychoplasmic is part of hypertrophy, but a lot of people spend most of their energy and time in this particular uh, phase of training consistently, week after week, month after month, year after year. So what is psychoplasmic training? So you're looking probably in, in the region of 10 to 20 repetitions plus. Sometimes people go up even higher. It's high volume. It's high frequency, very short rest periods. And the majority of people that I see uh, are training probably 30% of their one RM. And mostly they're using cable machines and they're using other resistance machines, trying to get that pump, trying to get as much lactate in the muscle. And we all know that the pump is only, it's very, very short duration. It doesn't last that long, right? But it is part of the uh hypertrophy format and it is part of the, the the training but i don't want you just to focus on this alone there is other elements which i'm going to tap into right now you could say that psychoplasmic training pump training is accumulation 
you would do lots of sets, lots of volume and so forth. And this is where I've been mentioning most people are currently training in. Maybe they don't know any other way or maybe it's so easy. Maybe it's an easier way of training. So I'm going to come on to more other aspects of training here in a second, which I believe is probably the most important, which is this particular slide, the myofibril, right? What's the myofibril? We're looking at deep fibers. Uh, the picture here is an illustration of many of you may already know him, Mike O'Hearn. Um, you watch a lot of his videos. He's an older, mature lifter, lifts very, very heavy weights under great control, great technique. In this particular picture, he's probably incline pressing 405. Very impressive at the age of, what, 51, I believe he is. But what is a myofibril training? How I look at it is most people say myofibril training is between one and five repetitions. For me, I like to call it as three and five repetitions with very low volume, low frequency, meaning that there's more days to recover and rest. You get longer rest periods in between sets, and you're probably using around 60 to 85% of your 1RM, mostly free weight, and with really tapping into something called the creatine phosphate phorylation, which basically means in our body, when we lift heavier loads, the creatine, phosphor, creatine phosphate phorylation only lasts for about three seconds, but we have to generate that, right? We have to create that in our bodies. So when we go past that three seconds, we use or we tap into what we call glycolysis, which is we start producing lactate. I was telling you earlier about the sarcoplasmic, which is where we start to use lactate, which is another pathway. Um, so when it comes to ATP, ATP um, is energy that we need, which we get from the mitochondria. Um, ATP will then disassociate to ADP and phosphate. Uh, and that phosphate is the creative phosphate, but it only lasts for three seconds. So this is why when you're using heavier loads, yeah, it's great to do low reps, but you can actually go a little bit past that and maybe go between three and five reps with lower volume, low frequency, longer rest periods. If you know a gentleman, I uh, believe his name's Pavel, he wrote a book called Beyond Bodybuilding. And in the book, he talks about when he works with his strength athletes, he gives them up to 10 minutes rest in between sets. Very, very interesting. I highly recommend that book, by the way. So this is my fibril. We're going to touch on this a little bit more detail, but it's very important. If you're looking to build muscle, sure, the sarcoplasmic pump train is important, but this is, I believe, just as of equal value for you if you're looking to build muscle. So going into a little bit more detail when it comes to my fibril. If we look at this section here, if you see my cursor here, let's call this a, a muscle cell, right? A, a whole muscle, for example, the bicep, right? And if we break it down here, we've got the fascicle. And if we break it down again, we've got the muscle cell, um, the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane. And then we break it down again. We've got this particular area here, which is what we call the myofibril. So we're going to those deeper layers. So let's kind of go over that in a little bit more detail here. When it comes to the myofibril, you, everything has a center. I read a great book years ago called, um, it was actually written by a gentleman called Thomas Troward. It's the Edinburgh Lectures. And he speaks about the mind is what we call, the mind is the center of divine operation. So with muscle, it has a center as well. And muscle has a midline. So this is the midline. And then with that, you've got these Z lines on each side, which basically hold the, the, the fin filament and the thick filament together. What is the fin filament? Well, the fin filament is what we call actin, and the thick filament is called myosin. And when these two come together, it shortens the muscle and the muscle contracts, okay? And this is what happens when we use heavier loads is we get to these deeper muscles. And this is why I'm recommending that we lift heavier loads with sarcoplasmic in different training phases in your training throughout the year. Now, rep ranges, what is a good rep range for building muscle? Well, there's many ways to do it. There's many ways to skin a cat. You've got max strength, which is one to five reps. And then you've got the hypertrophy reps, which is six to 15 reps, give or take. And then you've got endurance, right? Endurance where you go high, high, high reps, 15 reps plus, okay? Now, what I'm trying to say is that it's good to do a combination of all these in the training phase. Most people 
are in this particular phase when they're trying to build muscle, they're chasing that pump, right? Now, if we really want to start adding more foundation to our training, I want you to start looking at these lower numbers. I want you to be maybe between the three and five and maybe three and six repetitions. But that isn't what I'm saying there. Also, you want to also do a combination of high reps as well. So what Dr. Brad Schoenfield is saying is that the sweet spot is between six and 15 repetitions. So I'm just kind of giving you an idea of these different rep schemes that you want to take into consideration. Now, when it comes to progressive overload, right, we all know that each workout that we do, we want to be progressing some, some format. And there's many ways that you can do that. Most of us, when, we, when it comes to progressive overload, we will always go with increasing weight, which is the most logical thing to do. But what I want to bring to the table is something also that there's four other ways of progressive overload as well. You've got time under tension. You can put more stress on the muscle by creating a longer duration of time under that particular muscle. You can also increase repetitions. And you can also, more importantly, this is a big one, you can also increase the distance of a, an exercise. So, for example, in this picture here, you'll see me doing a heel elevated goblet squat. And the heel elevation allows the knees to get further away from the center of mass, placing more stress on the VMO, placing more stress, stress on the rec fem, and also on the vestus lateralis. And um, so when the knees are further away, you're going to put more stress on the muscle, but also you're creating a bigger distance. So this is another form of progressive overload. And then lastly, we've got volume, right? Volume meaning increasing your sets. Now, this is probably right here. If you've missed anything so far with this webinar, the fundamentals of hypertrophy. Intention is something that you really need to understand. Being from the UK, this was sort of ingrained in us bodybuilders from day one. Um, we're from what you would call the Arthur Jones, Mike Mensa, Dorian Yates um, philosophy of training, which means that it's high intensity, which is part of, I believe, my fibril training. Either way, whatever rep scheme you use, the goal or whatever rep, uh, rep ranges you use, the goal is to get close to muscular failure. What they're saying in the research is you don't have to go to failure. You can get close to it. Do I believe in that? Yes and no. How did I build my physique over the years? I trained to failure, but I only did it one time on the last set. What many people do that are high level with advanced trainees, they will do sets to failure if they're doing four sets all sets all four sets would be to failure what i'm trying to say is you only do one set to failure whatever rep range you use the bottom line is is that we want to increase the effort increase one's intensity and have more intent when we're training in the gym one thing that i see when i go into a lot of the commercial gyms in my local area here in ontario is people do want to build muscle but I don't see them pushing themselves. I don't see them really um, getting as much effort as they should be in their training. So what I would like them to do, if I was coaching them, I would want to increase their intensity, increase their effort. But it's hard for me to say because I don't really know what their goals are. But if their goal is to build tissue and to build muscle hypertrophy, we have to look at this as one of the most important variables when it comes to building muscle. And intensity is the core driver. However, it's something that you cannot measure. If you look on the right-hand section here, I call it the re referee in your intensity or effort. I use a free set system here. Set one, you're probably using about, you know, you're going about 50% intensity. Set number two is you're going maybe 60%. So you're holding back. And then the last set, you would go all out. And I would call this the growth stimulator where you would go, to failure or shy of failure a lot of people are talking about rir reps in reserve you would probably be a nine or an eight for reps in reserve meaning you'll have one or two reps left in the tank um i believe there's nothing wrong with going to failure providing you're doing it with the right exercises which i'll come on to here in a second okay rep ranges compound versus isolation now, I was talking about rep ranges increasing one's intensity. It would be a good idea to not go to failure on a big compound movement like a squat or a deadlift. 
if you were to watch a great DVD, which I would highly recommend that you watch, and I've watched it thousands of times, is Dorian Yates' Blood and Guts. You'll notice that when he does bigger movements, bigger compound exercises like deadlift, he doesn't go to failure. But when you see him on the machines, like doing bicep curls, um, unilateral one-arm bicep curl, or he's doing lateral raises, you'll notice that he goes to complete muscular failure. He may include drop sets, rest pauses, and so forth. Here in this particular diagram here, we're using the leg curl. Um, it, would we go to failure on the leg curl or shire failure? Probably because it's safer and there's less risk involved. With a squat and a deadlift, there's more risk involved if you do go to failure. Um, if you're doing the leg press, it might be something that you could do. You could get close to failure. But what I'm trying to say is it's not a good idea to go to failure or, or get close to failure on the bigger compound movements. One thing that I do and uh, my, my partner and I, Jasmine, is that we work with a lot of clients that are more mature. They're probably 35 and over, and they've been lifting for a lot of years. So a lot of them do have some joint discrepancies, and they may have some shoulder health issues. So you have to be very careful with, with um, load and also how many reps you're doing. Obviously, pounding rep after rep does you know put a lot of stress on the joints. So would it be a good idea to maybe use a higher rep range as opposed to using a lower rep range if someone has discomfort in their shoulders? It would probably be a good idea. So if I, would, if I were you and you do have shoulder discrepancies is to maybe use a higher rep range instead of using lower rep ranges with heavier loads. When it comes to other exercises and joint health, alternative or exercise alternatives for joint health, let's say you are somebody that likes to do flat bench presses with the barbell. But every time you bench press, you might get some discomfort in the elbow. Maybe your anterior delts maybe hurt a little bit. So what you could do is maybe instead of doing the flat bench, uh, which I'm not a fan of, by the way, for hypertrophy, I find that the most pec tears or pectoral tears happen on the flat bench. I would maybe opt for the person, the trainee, to go into maybe an incline press. If that causes discomfort, then maybe look at trying a, a dip, as an example, as you can see here with the third picture. What exercises do you select when you're trying to build muscle? Now, when I build programs, I always take into consideration this format that I'm showing you right here. This is sort of my foundation when I'm programming for clients is I look at the horizontal push, vertical push, hip hinging, vertical pull, horizontal pull and squat. And around that, as the icing on the cake, I would adding accessories like lateral raises, bicep curls, tricep push downs, calf exercises. But this is, this is the meat. This is the meat of the training program. This is what creates the foundation. And I always keep this as the main weapon in people's training. And then I add on the uh, accessories on top of this, if that makes sense. Another thing to take in consideration is the atomical planes of motion. There's there's three of them, the sagittal plane, uh, there's frontal plane and transverse plane. What, I'm, what I like to do is make sure that we are tapping into this. When it comes to sagittal plane, without going into too much detail, think of an exercise is that you're doing this in a narrow hallway. And if you're doing it in a narrow hallway, that would mean you'd be able to do a squat. You would be able to do a front or reverse lunge. You would be able to do a bicep curl. You'd be able to do maybe a close grip bench press and um, things of that nature. When it comes to frontal plane, you want to add in exercises that are coming away from the body. So maybe a lateral raise would be a frontal plane movement or a side lunge would be a frontal plane exercise. And, and as a matter of fact, Maybe a lat pull down. Lat pull down means the elbows are coming out to the side, and this will be considered a frontal plane exercise. When it comes to transverse plane, it gets a little bit tricky here. You would maybe look at doing some type of wood chop exercise where the um, the um, you're, you're rotating on the axis. Also, a bench press would be considered a, a, a transverse plane exercise. Even a dumbbell fly would be considered a transverse plane. What you're trying to do here is make sure that you're hitting all planes of motion when you're doing your hypertrophy training. Structure and function. I always say that structure equals function. So the way you're built will determine how you function in the gym. So let's use this as an example. A taller athlete, maybe six foot plus, 
might not do very well at doing a barbell squat. Why? Because they've maybe got a long torso. Maybe they've got a long femur and it just doesn't fit right. I, I work with a few tall athletes and every time I get them to squat, it just doesn't look right. And a lot of coaches will understand what I'm trying to say here because we just know just by looking at them that it's not an optimal optimal movement for them because they're just so long and they're so tall. So what would be a good alternative movement? Maybe putting them into the leg press. As a matter of fact, if they can't do a barbell squat, maybe try doing a Smith machine squat. It might be a little bit safer for them. So structure determines function. Last but not least, when it comes to the fundamentals of training for hypertrophy, recovery is right up there of oxygen. It is the most important variable. I look at these three factors. If a client is training very, very hard and increasing intensity, they've got good form and execution. They are looking at progressive overload. They're progressing nicely. They're using deloads as well in their training, which is also something I haven't spoken about. But when it comes to recovery, these three things need to come into play. These are essential to your success. Number one would be your sleep. We all know the importance. A lot of us just aren't doing it. We're burning a candle at both ends. We're maybe getting five hours, four hours of broken sleep a night, especially in this day and age, right? Stress is very high. But we want to make sure if we're not getting a good eight hours sleep or seven hours sleep, maybe take a nap during the day. That was something that I did up and coming as a amateur bodybuilder. I would take lots of naps during the day. This is something that I tell a lot of my clients to do if they're looking to build muscle. A lot of them say, well, I don't have the time. Well, I always say, well, how much do you want to build muscle? Number two, nutrition. We all know the benefits of nutrition. ATP, energy, mitochondria, power, making sure you sit down, eating mindfully, chewing your food, not being distracted. And um, that way your food can digest, uh, making sure that you're getting, you know, a, a adequate amount of protein. You're using your carbohydrates for performance in the gym. I see too many people in a calorie deficit that complain that they can't put on muscle because they're under eating, they're undernourished and they have no energy to perform in the gym. So your carbohydrates pre and post workout are essential for energy performance in the gym. And then lastly, number three, this would be the Zen, right? Being Zen, what we wanna focus on here, lastly, number three is when you're outside of the gym, and this is something that I learned personally, um, talking with Dorian Yates many occasions in England after turning pro, um, is to when you leave the gym and you've really taxed the body, you've trained very, very hard and, and intelligently, you want to leave the gym and your goal is to basically, I always coin, you want to live like a Buddhist monk outside of the gym if your goal is to build muscle. You see, and the reason why I say that is because if you're training hard, lifting heavy loads with good form, that's stress on the body, right? So, with that, you want to be living like a Buddhist monk outside of the gym. Ideally, I know it's hard to do in this day and age, right? But the point is, is to keep stress down so that way you can grow. I look at muscle building as you stimulate growth in the gym. And then when you leave the gym, you allow Mother Nature to do her part, which is to rest, digest, and then you grow. I look at it also as um, if you were to take a, pe a sheet of sandpaper and apply it on your hand. And if you kept rubbing it and rubbing it and rubbing, it would bleed, right? What heals that wound? We don't heal it. Mother Nature heals it. And the same thing applies to muscle. This is why your, your volume has to be cautiously regulated when you train. Um, and if you're not seeing results in the gym, maybe your libido is suffering, maybe your appetite is suffering, maybe you just feel tired all the time, maybe you need to have more rest days, or maybe you need a deload week. And these things are just as important as training itself. So that's it for me, Coach Troy Brown signing off. These are the fundamental principles of hypertrophy. I hope you've got some value. As always, leave a comment below and please subscribe to the YouTube channel if you've got more out of this video. And I'll do more videos on this if you like these types of videos. I can do more in the future for you. Have a great day and take care and train hard, train smart. And remember, restability is very, very important. Cheerio.